Imagine murdering a black woman in a bar full of countless witnesses, the murder being filmed, uploaded to social media, going viral, and then immediately getting out on $5,000 bail before your victim can even be laid to rest, and then less than six months later, getting all of your charges stayed, allowing you to literally get away with murder. That's the reality of a privileged white woman named Paige Thoreau Fisher from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. To have all charges dropped was completely like absolutely shocking to myself and to my family. So that's something that was way beyond anything that we would have ever imagined to happen. Actually, don't even remember. I feel like I just really blacked out. We didn't even know what to In say. In the last update video that I did about the Hodenhashi case, I said I would be following and updating information as it was released. But the date in the new year that Paige was supposed to be in court, I was unable to find any information. And I was confused as to why that was. And I was not able to provide the updates. But I could tell something was suspicious. And unfortunately, that gut feeling I had was right. This is Hoden Hashi case update part three. So if you're not updated, make sure to go back, listen or watch those other episodes and then come right back here. I recently had the privilege of having a conversation with Fartoon, who is Hoden Hashi's sister. Uh, we talked about the case, how her family is feeling and what she and the Hashi family feel is important for the public to know. And I'm sharing this information throughout this podcast with her full consent and approval. But if you would like to hear more of her thoughts directly, then make sure to head over to her Twitter. I will leave a link to that in the description below. And also make sure to follow the Hashi's pages at Justice for Hoden Hashi on Instagram. And their Twitter is at Justice for Hoden. Again, all those links can be found below. <laughs> editing Jada here. So when I initially filmed the video, the Hashis had not taken any additional steps or announced to the public what they wanted them to do, but they have since released an email template that you can go and send to prosecutors on their behalf. So you can find that link down below. They've also announced that they will be doing a series of protests in Ottawa, Saskatchewan and Regina on Saturday, April 29th at 2 p.m. So make sure to go over on their Twitter or their Instagram where you can find all of that information. You can stay updated and you can support them because they are going to need all the public support they can get to try and hold Paige accountable in our quote unquote justice system. The family has also put up an, a GoFundMe for their legal fees and you can find that link in the description down below. If you cannot donate, then just make sure to share and do what you can to support the Hashis because they honestly deserve it all. They deserve it all. The first thing that she felt was so important to get out there is that Hoden was not a violent person and she was not a fighter. She was not the type to instigate a fight ever. According to Fartoon, Hoden was the sweetest out of all of their siblings. She did not have an evil bone in her body. She was just kind, sincere, and friendly to absolutely everyone she met, just genuinely the sweetest person ever. There have been circulating claims that Hoden was the one who started the fight, but the Hashi family does not at all believe this to be true, simply because of Hoden's character, but above all else, they have not been shown any proof that would convince them otherwise. Hoden was and is deeply loved, and she will continue to be deeply missed. It should also be very clear that when Paige attacked Hoden, she was thrown onto the ground where she landed on glass that severed her main artery, Hoden then began to bleed out profusely while Paige continued to punch her, pull her hair, and drag her through her own blood while Hoden was literally dying in her hands. Fartoon questions how one can continue to viciously beat someone while they are bleeding out. In our conversation, I brought up how I feel like the media is playing a large part in supporting the narrative that Paige and her lawyers are trying to spin by the use of passive language, and Fartoon agreed. We agreed that the use of terms like freak accident or she fell on glass or it was a mutual fight, it was a consensual fight, Hoden died, Hoden passed away, Hoden died following an altercation, it removes the burden of responsibility off of Paige and puts it back onto Hoden. Imagine publicly and pridefully shifting the blame onto the dead victim. Hoden was murdered. She was attacked and then murdered in a room full of people. Saying anything else downplays and dumbs down the severity of harm that Paige has caused. Fortune added that the video that went viral clearly shows that Anne Hoda and her sister did not even have a chance to defend herself. On February 3rd, 2023, the Hashi family filed a lawsuit against a number of individuals who contributed to Hoden's murder and the sensationalization of her death that ensued afterwards. The lawyer representing the family says that people have to understand how their actions have touched the lives of many others, and that has to be well known. He says that Hoden's family suffered an enormous amount of grief and hurt and continues to suffer. At the time the suit was filed, Paige's charges were still pending, so he said that he and the Hashi family felt it was super important to launch civil action. 
He said, and I quote, sometimes criminal proceedings can take years and it is simply not right to have this family linger in a dark hole of not knowing what is happening, what will happen and wait for justice to be brought about. The lawsuit claims are meant to cover costs of, of medical and funeral expenses, grief counseling, past and future loss earnings, as well as further out-of-pocket expenses. Those being sued by the Hashi family are, are Caleb Coat Senger, who is the one who actually recorded the attack and uploaded it to social media shortly thereafter. The family is seeking a minimum of $100,000 in damages from Callup directly, stating in the suit that in an effort to obtain social media notoriety and quasi-fame, the defendant deliberately and intentionally posted the footage online. His actions are abhorrent, contemptible, flagrant, outrageous, and lacking in decency. The family's lawyer, Nicholas Dushinoff, says that the recording and the sharing of the video showing Hoden's death is a disgusting thing to have done. He says that the horror of having a video circulated on social media with your loved one in her death throes bleeding out is an appalling thing to have to know is out there. The crazy cactus bar owners and promoters are listed for their failure to uphold their duty of care to Hoden, as there is an expectation that patrons would be kept safe from harm and assaults. During the event, an altercation occurred between Paige and Hoden, wherein Paige intentionally and violently assaulted Hoden, repeatedly striking Hoden with her fists and slash or a glass object, and knocking or forcing Hoden to the ground. Hoden suffered substantial and ultimately lethal injuries, including but not limited to lacerations to the face and neck, causing her to suffer blood loss and death. The suit further says that the venue did not adequately provide security, staffing, or adequately trained staff, and they hadn't taken steps to remove weapons from patrons or hazards from the floor that it knew or ought to have known existed, like glass. The DJ who encouraged the fight is also listed, stating that the DJ observed the altercation and wrongfully and negligently encouraged and fostered a continuation of the assault and escalation of the violence that was being perpetrated upon the deceased, Hoden. Damages owed by the nightclub operators, owners, the DJ, and the promoter would be determined if the suit is successful. And it is worth noting that since Hoden's murder, the Facebook and Instagram pages for the Crazy Cactus Bar have been taken down and the club's windows are now covered up with brown paper. Of course, the primary person in this lawsuit listed is Paige Thoreau Fisher herself. The Hashi family is seeking general damages from Paige for over a million dollars and an additional $60,000 for the distress that Hoden's murder has caused the Hashi family. The suit says that Paige assaulted Hoden with the intention of causing her to suffer grievous bodily injury or death, and I absolutely agree. Now, this may sound like a lot of money, but it is worth noting that Paige's family, they're very wealthy and very influential in the Saskatoon area in many ways, but we'll discuss that a little bit later on in depth. But it's also worth referencing that their suit is not unfounded or ill-conceived as Paige's lawyers would like you to think. In the lawsuit, the family actually referenced the $29.5 million U.S. lawsuit settlement that was reached by the Los Angeles County with late NBA star Kobe Bryant's widow after first responders shared graphic photos of the scene of the 2020 helicopter crash, which resulted in a variety of deaths. Laws are different in Canada and the US, but the lawsuit states that the loss and devastation to the family and the shock of having the death of their loved one is the same. Since the family was left out of all discussions about Paige's charges and the trial, a lawsuit is truly the only way that they are able to take justice into their own hands. However, Weeks after the suit was filed, Paige's lawyer spoke out in a statement to CTV stating that she received and reviewed the statement of claim. She says that Paige, quote unquote, denies the assertion set out in the statement of claim, specifically that she assaulted the deceased. We have been instructed to vigorously defend this ill-conceived legal action and stand by our previous comments that Paige's actions were justifiable at law as self-defense. On April 11th, 2023, it was announced that all charges against Paige have been stayed. Stayed charges mean that they're put on pause, but more often than not, when charges are stayed, they will be dropped, or if they aren't pursued within a year, they will just remain stayed, which is legally equivalent to the charges being withdrawn. It's a very weird limbo gray type of area, which allows the accused to face absolutely no consequences, no jail time, and they have no record. Based on the Justice Ministry's statement, it's clear that they have absolutely no plans to charge Paige or hold her accountable in any way for the untimely murder of Hoden. Marika Andrew, who is a representative for the Ministry of 
Corrections, Policing, and Public Safety was the one who issued the statement. She says that it is increasingly rare for the power of reinstating the charges to be used, but it could be done in the case of newly discovered evidence. So they're not going to do it. The rest of the ministry statement states that the death was accidental. Don't believe that. Um, they say that based off of the video evidence and corroborated witness statements, it was a mutual fight, which again, do not believe that. During the fight, the this is just what they're saying, that during the fight, two women went to the ground and tragically, Hoden Hashi was cut by a broken glass lying on the floor. Based on the evidence, that cut was the fatal injury that caused Miss Hashi's death. Which, did they see the same video that was circulated? Or It's not like Hoden just fell on her own, right? She was attacked and then fell. They say that after careful consideration, public prosecution has concluded that the fatal injury resulted from an accident and there is no reasonable likelihood of conviction for the charge of manslaughter or any other criminal charge. The prosecutor's office said that they are aware their conclusion comes as a disappointment for many. Um, and they say that the decision to not move forward with criminal proceedings in this situation does not lessen the tragedy or seriousness of what has occurred. But... That's exactly what that decision does. It absolutely does. Now, Paige's lawyer obviously agrees with their BS statement, saying that the decision to enter a state of proceedings in a tragedy such as this is not made lightly. But however, I would disagree with that because it came less than six months after she was originally charged. So it does seem like it was a decision made very lightly and for a variety of reasons, which we'll talk about in a second. Page's lawyer says that they can say unreservedly that this was the correct decision from both a legal and public policy perspective. I would like further insights into what that means, public policy perspective. Uh, it's it, that that phrasing is weird, um, but then also says and we extend our highest regard to the Crown Prosecutor and their office for this difficult decision in the matter. I don't think it was difficult for them. I think it was quite easy for them to drop charges on a white woman, but that's just me. Then she talks out the other side of her mouth and says that this was a tragic situation for all involved, one which has inexorably altered the course of the Hashi and Thoreau Fisher families. I do not understand how they can possibly try and insinuate that the harm and the way that things have been altered for the Hashi family is comparable or similar to what has happened to the murderer's family. She says, our client has maintained that this was an act of self-defense, which I don't believe, and she never intended for any harm to come to Miss Hashi, which again, I also do not believe. It is not lost on Miss Thoreau Fisher that the Hashi family has lost a daughter, a sister, a cousin, and a friend, and we extend our heartfelt condolences to the Hashi family. There's that passive language again, acting like Paige is not the one responsible for taking Hoden away from her, all of her loved ones finishes out her statement by saying, we wish them well in their journey towards finding peace and healing. I don't know why, but that statement just, it gives all lives matter energy. I don't, like, I wish you the best. You killed somebody. Now, the Hashi family is sickened and outraged at the decision to stay the charges. They are absolutely distraught and they cannot wrap their heads around this entire situation. That the Crown and the defenses claim that, that there's not enough evidence to charge Paige with anything is a lie. More than ample evidence that Paige had motive to kill Hoden and yet they let her go. Something that's not been discussed in the media, that's not been discussed very actively when it absolutely should be. Paige had previously harassed Hoden on a number of occasions, okay? This was not like they saw each other and then Paige attacked her and then that was it. They had previous beef, or I can't even say they had previous beef. Paige had previous beef with Hoden. Paige would call Hoden's job all the time in an attempt to get her fired. The year before Hoden was murdered, Paige had previously attacked her and security had to pull her off of Hoden. Paige had been harassing Hoden, and yet the media and the courts are completely ignoring this fact. Fartoon says that if Paige was the victim, Hoden would be sitting in a jail cell without any opportunity for bail, possibly even facing second-degree murder charges. She said that they would have made an example out of my sister, yet my sister is dead, and they're still trying to portray it like Paige was the victim. The Hashis believe that racial bias is at play and they are absolutely right about that. There's no way that someone like my sister or any person of color would have walked away with zero consequences for their actions that night if the roles were reversed. So I think in anything in life, um, race does play a role and I, I, I do believe it did in this case. Fartoon tweeted, not one charge. She is walking away a free woman while my sister is buried six feet. Not a murder charge, not a manslaughter charge. 
not even an aggravated assault charge, not one thing. This is the value of black life in Canada. Fartoon says that their complete disregard for black life is very evident. Anti-blackness is embedded in our structures and our systems, and a province like Saskatchewan is not afraid to hide their racism. This is also evident when comparing Page's case to a very similar case in which an Indigenous man named Jake Lee Ottertail was the perpetrator. Valerie Adamco is the prosecutor who made the decision to stay Page's charges, according to Fartoon, but is also the same one who fiercely demanded that Jake receive 10 years in prison and not a day less. Jake Austin, Lee Ottertail, and Bert Havercourt met at Salvation Army in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Both men clicked, they got along super well, so they began to look for work and decided to live together in a home in the Caswell Hill neighborhood. On August 7th, 2010, Jake Lee Ottertail and his roommate Bert got into a drunken argument which resulted in the death of Bert in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Now keep in mind, Jake is indigenous, Bert is white. Jake was charged with second degree murder. Now there was another person present in the home, Bert's friend, Darren Shackleton, um, because he was sleeping on the couch while he was looking for work in the city. They just let him stay. So Darren's version of events are as follows. And I just want to note, I'm not saying that this is absolutely what happened. These are just the only version of events that have been made public since Jake did not testify at his own trial. And there was only one discrepancy that Jake had with this version of events anyways. But also keep in mind, he was very intoxicated. So he prob he did not remember exactly what happened himself. But Darren said that he was not drinking, at least not drinking as heavily as they were. He said that Jake and Bert were drinking outside on the deck at around 8.30 p.m. when he first arrived. The men continued to drink together for the next couple of hours. At some point, they came inside and they began arguing, but what exactly they were arguing about was unclear to Darren. He said that he heard Bert say, though, Jake, you've got to calm down. You're going native on me. But when he was first interrogated after Bert's death, he said that Bert called Jake an Indian, which is a derogatory racial slur. This statement was a trigger for Jake, and understandably so, but Darren says that, that Jake got angry, and before he knew it, both men were fighting after Bert had threatened to, quote, kick the shit out of Jake. They began hitting each other in the face and the chest. Darren says that he was shocked sitting on the couch, watching these two guys beat each other up, but he did not intervene, he didn't do anything to break up the fight, and he didn't call authorities to help break up the fight. He just watched. He then says that it was clear Bert was over fighting and wanted to call the police, so he went into his bedroom to, ju to do just that, but Jake followed him. And then there was silence. No one was talking, and it didn't sound like anyone was fighting anymore. But that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, so they just went in the bedroom and stared at each other. Then a few minutes later, he says that he heard an eerie cracking sound, like someone snapping a big stick over their knee. This is when he finally got up to see what was going on. He peeked in the bedroom to see Bert on the bed with his arms sprawled out, blood coming from his face, and Jake was on top of him. He then saw Jake hit Bert three times on the side of the head. He grabbed his phone, ran outside, and called 911. Police were called at 11.59 p.m. and arrived at 12.08 a.m. When they entered, Bert was laying dead in the doorway between the kitchen and the deck. How exactly he got there is unclear. Dr. Sean Latham said that the cause of death was blunt force trauma and the autopsy said that Bert's blood alcohol level was three and a half times above the legal limit. The police say that Jake was asleep in his bed prior to them waking him up and arresting him. Jake told investigators after his arrest, because he had been charged with secondary murder, that he thought he had knocked Bert out during a fight. He didn't intend to cause him serious harm. So his death was manslaughter, not murder. However, it's important to note that the media depiction of Bert mimics the media depiction of Paige, despite Bert being the victim and Paige being the perpetrator. Bert's sister, Christina Havercourt, says that Bert was harmless and she believes that alcohol played a significant role in the incident. Bert's other sister, Ramona Kozak, says that he did not have a vicious bone in his body. We're besides ourselves here. This is awful. As I mentioned before, Jake was originally charged with secondary murder, but at sentencing, Judge Mona Devell said that Jake was provoked into the fight by being called a racial slur and, and being threatened, but he was too intoxicated to form the intention of killing Bert, especially because there were no previous tensions brought up or no previous tensions at play. At sentencing... Crown Prosecutor Val Adamco says that 
Now keep in mind, this is the same prosecutor responsible for Paige's case, okay? Just keep that in your thoughts right here. She requested a net sentence of 10 years, called the severity of the attack, quote, as close to murder as you can get. The derogatory comment, in her opinion, didn't justify a beating so forceful that it caused Bert's heart to explode. She made a point of stating out other aggravated factors, such as the element of trust between the two men, trying to say that Jake was aware of hurting Bert before going to bed and leaving the victim in a pool of his own blood. And yet, when there were similar circumstances, in Paige and Hoden's case, charges were stayed. The only difference between this case and that case, there were actual aggravating factors. Paige had been harassing Hoden for quite some time, had attacked her previously, attacked her. It was not a mutual fight. Paige attacked her, okay? And yet, charges were stayed. Jake was an indigenous man who she demonized and characterized as being aggressive and alcoholic and a danger to society. But Paige, a white woman, made an accident. It was a mutual fight. And it's tragic that Hoden died, but it's not Paige's fault. It smells like racial bias to me. It smells like systemic racism. It smells like institutionalized prejudice. But what do I know? Jake's defense attorney, Morris Bodner, said that a five-year sentence was more than acceptable and would allow him to complete alcohol programming while in jail. Jake had no history of violence. He shows complete potential for rehabilitation and was immediately remorseful after realizing what he had done. Judge Mona agreed that the remorse shown after the attack throughout the trial and throughout sentencing was absolutely genuine, whereas for Paige, I cannot say the same. Jake actually spoke for the first time. Prior to his sentence being announced, he burst into tears and apologized to Bert's family. He admitted that he drank too much and he blacked out, so he does not remember much of the attack at all. He also said that Darren was partly at fault for just observing everything and not stepping in to prevent the fight from escalating. And he's absolutely right. And that's, again, very similar to the Hoden Hashi case in terms of everyone just sitting around watching the fight happen as entertainment, not stepping in to intervene, not stepping in to save Hoden's life. So Jake's charge was ultimately downgraded from secondary murder to manslaughter, but he was ultimately sentenced to Val's recommendation of 10 years, but he would only have to spend seven years in jail, like in prison, due to time served while he was awaiting the completion of his trial. But you can see these circumstances are eerily similar, and yet Val advocated for the max for Jake, and yet stayed the charges with Paige. On Wednesday, April 12th, 2023, Paige spoke out for the first time alongside her lawyer. Her lawyer is asking the public to keep an open mind. And to that, we the public say hell fucking no. Absolutely not. There's no open-mindedness about a murderer getting off. There's no open minds there. So sorry. But also not sorry at all. She said that Paige cannot discuss the details of that night publicly due to the lawsuit, but Paige continues to maintain that she acted in self-defense, which is a lie. But because of racism and racial stereotyping, she is able to paint Hoden as the aggressive one despite her being the aggressor herself. She described the incident as a perfect storm of unfortunate events. Again, that passive aggressive language that we were talking about before. She says that the videos circulating on social media do not capture the full essence of the events that day, stating that a lot of evidence gathered by the police has not been made public out of respect for the privacy and dignity of the Hashi family. Trying to make it seem as if Paige and the lawyers are trying to protect the Hashis. They are not trying to protect anyone but Paige. They don't care about the Hashis. Don't let them fool you with this rhetoric of stating otherwise. They obviously do not care. And then goes on to say that social media obviously does not include all of the evidence police have gathered and the Crown and the defense have in their possession. I do not believe they even tried to gather any evidence against Paige. Within hours, her second degree murder charge was downgraded to manslaughter. She was let out on $5,000 bail. And then just a little bit after the lawsuit was issued, her charges were stayed. I don't believe for one second that they even tried. I have never seen something move so quick in getting someone off than this case right here. So Paige herself spoke and said that learning about this stay for the first time was surreal. She wasn't expecting something like this to happen, especially so soon. I do not believe her. It's also interesting that the first thing you say is not a genuine show of remorse like with Jake. The first thing you do is talk about you. She says that, quote, this day, this was never meant to happen. And if she could, 
she would take that day back when asked if she had a message for the Hashi family. Again, centering herself in that whole situation. Not at all expressing remorse for the fact that Hoden had died. The, their loss. She wishes she could take the day back. You're still here. She says, I really do wish Hoden was with us today. And I really, really hope the family can heal and move forward. Again, the same exact statement that her lawyer said. So it's very clear that they prepped her with what she was to say. And she was not to admit any full on responsibility for anything. But even if they hadn't prepped her, I do not think that she takes responsibility or accountability. I think in her delusional mind, she genuinely believes that she acted in self-defense and that she did nothing wrong despite harassing Hoden and attacking her on multiple occasions. And this is what got me so sick, so sick. Only a white woman can publicly murder someone and then less than six months later, have the charges stayed, okay, equivalent to them being withdrawn, be smiling in a press conference, having your entire life ahead of you. Meanwhile, the Hashi's lives have been forever altered by her aggression. The privilege that is wrapped up in this case is ridiculous and it is so evident by Paige going on a press tour feigning remorse for stealing a life and acting sympathetic only now after the charges have been stayed. We have now come to the part of the podcast where I give my thoughts, my feelings, my opinions, and we just take a minute to debrief all of that information. So first and foremost, the passive language in the news is really irritating my spirits, right? The things like Hoden died, Hoden passed away, Hoden died following an altercation. Homegirl was murdered. She was attacked and she was murdered in a club full of people. Saying anything just pacifies Paige's responsibility and I do not like it and it also goes to show how powerful rhetoric is because now you have Paige going out and mimicking the same words that the media has been going out so it's like all of this just it seems too strategic it seems too thoroughly planned and now that the charges against Paige have been stayed and they've made it clear they have no intentions of reinstating the charges or laying any additional charges the only real chance the Hashi family has at receiving any form of justice is their lawsuit the timing of the charges being stayed is very suspicious to me, okay? At the beginning of February, they filed the lawsuit. End of February, beginning of March, Paige's lawyer is asked about it. She says she saw it and basically gives that little two-piece statement. And then all of a sudden, about a month after that, charges are stayed, right? Why did it happen just, you know, that quick? right? It seems suspicious, right? You have racism at play, you have classism at play, you have the system basically working the way it was designed to in real time, yeah? The system was created to protect wealthy and influential white people, specifically white women, and oppress, demean, and belittle black people in life and in death. The Hashi's family lawsuit is valid and it's super fair, but it very much seems like they're setting the stage for another quick dismissal as Paige's staying of charges happened so soon after the suit was filed. Again, after there was nothing going on when Paige was supposed to be back in court. And then her lawyer's statement actually came out closer to the time when the charges were stayed rather than when the suit was initially filed. But more so, the statements made by Paige's lawyer and the Ministry of Justice just invalidating the Hashi's desire for any form of justice and absolving Paige of any legal or moral responsibility. I do not want to see the lawsuit get dismissed or get dropped, but it very much feels like it's heading in that direction as a lot of people also were trying to tell me, oh, Paige is connected to like law enforcement and whatever. I have not found any proof of that to be true. What I did find proof to be true is that her family is very wealthy, they're very influential, and there's well-known business people in affluent circles in Saskatoon. So racism is at play because they're white. Classism is also at play. And when anytime you have isms intersecting, interacting, it's never going to be good for the person who is at the target, who is at the base of that, which in this case is the Hashi family. The Hashi family, my heart goes out to them and I feel for them and I thank them so much for trusting me enough to come to me with the information and trust me enough to put that information out there on their behalf. I I feel honored to do it. I, It's a horrible circumstance, but I'm grateful that that trust and that foundation is there. I do think that everybody should go and follow them, support them, uplift them, do basically whatever they ask, right? If they're asking you to send letters, if they're asking you to show up and protest, do that. But make sure you stay engaged and interact because the more public attention weans, the more bullshit Paige and her lawyers are going to be able to get away with. 
Again, I will leave all of that in the description below. And I thank you so much for tuning into this part three case update of Hoden Hashi. Make sure to follow, support the family, uplift them, send them a kind message of how you're keeping them in your thoughts and your prayers, send them all the love, the strength, and the healing energy that they deserve. And I'll make sure to keep you updated with any other information that comes out. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you in the next episode.